This is Red Eye Flight number 303, heading to the city of Yakutsk in Siberia. We're on our way to one of the most northerly cities in Russia. Just 280 miles from the Arctic Circle, six time zones from Moscow. I'm joined by Aliona Pimenova, who'll be my translator and guide as I travel to some of the coldest places on Earth. It's my first time in Siberia. It's an enormous region that covers 77% of Russia. To put it in perspective, it takes up about 10% of the land mass on Earth. It is massive, and a good portion of that is permafrost, that land that is frozen all the time except for that top layer that freezes in the winter, thaws in the summer. 70% of Russia lies on permafrost. It's a permanently frozen layer below the Earth's surface, made up of layer after layer of soil, sediment, rock, and ice, built up over thousands of years. So, how deep does it go? Yakutsk has what I need to find out. The deepest hole in permafrost anywhere. And it just so happens they're doing maintenance on it today. They're going to work right now. They're trying to get rid of the ice. It's called the Shurgan Shaft. Started in 1827 and now 380 feet deep, built to explore how far down the frozen ground goes. It's really amazing how deep this shaft really is. There's a chart here on the wall. The worker that's down there right now is about here. It goes a long way down. Information acquired here shows that the permafrost in Siberia is some of the thickest in the world a mile and a half deep in some places. The entire city of Yakutsk is built on it, which has led to some peculiar adaptations. One thing about building a city on permafrost is the top layer, well, it's not so permanent. So a lot of the buildings here in Yakutsk are actually up on these concrete stilts. It's the only way to keep the foundations from warping when it melts and refreezes. Installing and repairing pipes in frozen ground, extremely difficult. So what they've done is put them above ground and insulated the hell out of them. Infrastructure and houses are vulnerable to the shifting ground. Some of the buildings here in Yakutsk are actually twisting and sinking into the permafrost. This is known as subsidence. The top layer refreezes each winter, but to varying thicknesses as Siberia gets warmer. Today, it's minus one degree Celsius, which is far from normal. The average winter temperature here in Yakutsk is actually minus 34 degrees. It is nowhere near that today. The skaters are enjoying this warm spell. Siberia is one of the fastest warming places on the planet, and that has potentially serious consequences for the permafrost below. What most people don't realize is that trapped under the permafrost here is a ticking time bomb for climate change. I've come to the underground laboratory here at the Permafrost Institute to learn more. The coolest part of the Permafrost Institute, literally and figuratively, is the tunnel they've built underneath the building, 12 meters down. Here they can actually study the permafrost in situ. Leading expert Dr. Alexander Fedorov has observed some big changes. What is the main problem that they're studying? The permafrost melting. Right. The temperature changes, 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 the temperature changes. Melting permafrost is releasing huge amounts of methane gas, causing global concern. Researchers have found lakes literally bubbling with methane. Permafrost acts like a lid, locking carbon gases like methane in the ground. All that gas was formed from long buried organic matter, dead animals and plant life that have been on ice for thousands of years. Now, increased heat is penetrating deeper into the permafrost, thawing it and releasing these dangerous greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. This could have a bigger impact on global warming than the burning of fossil fuels. Our carbon emissions cause the permafrost to melt 
releasing methane gas, which causes the climate to warm, which causes the permafrost to melt even more, runaway greenhouse effect that could put us in the position where it becomes irreversible. Every year, Dr. Fedorov and his team drill deep into the ground to analyze changes in the permafrost. How far down do you drill? Five meters, six meters. That's some tough stuff. Dr. Fedorov probes the permafrost in many locations. And what he's seeing in northern Yakutia is alarming. We have surface subsidence more than two meters. Surface su subsidence of yeah. two meters. Subside. As the icy permafrost melts, the ground sinks. The formation of thaw ponds and lakes is rapidly increasing all over northeastern Siberia. You're seeing dramatic changes. Yes, yes. Scientists predict that the area of permafrost in the northern hemisphere will decline by 20 to 35 percent by the middle of this century, releasing a monumental amount of greenhouse gas. But as the ground melts, it's also unearthing some fascinating finds. It looks like roadkill from last week, but it's 12,000 years old. While the melting permafrost is a major concern, there is one positive side effect. The thawing has led to some incredible discoveries. It's not just methane gas that's released by the melting permafrost. Sometimes things like woolly mammoths are found here. And Yakutia is the place in the world to find these frozen prehistoric creatures. There's a researcher here who's going to show me exactly what that's all about. The Mammoth Museum houses the most diverse collection of ancient animals in the world, some of which were recently exposed in the thawing ground. Do you think that as our climate gets warmer, it'll be easier to find more of these mammoths? Yeah. <laughs> Вот этого бизончика, который там лежит, и тушу лошади. Today, Professor Grigoryev is taking me behind the scenes to show me some of his most impressive discoveries. Most important place in museum. Yes. Wow. Mammoth tusks. Yes. Very good preserved tusks of Malolakovsky mammoths with blood, with uh, muscles, and one of the first. A domesticated dog. On what the is the road. first domesticated dog? Geological age, 12 and a half thousand. 12 and a half thousand years old. The pressure of layer upon layer of built up ice flattened this dog. It looks like roadkill from last week, but it's 12,000 years old. You can see the teeth and the hair, everything here. It's amazing. You can find similar find only in Yakutia. In Yakutia. Without a question, this is the strangest walk-in freezer that I've ever been in. The discovery of prehistoric animals demonstrates that the land is thawing, but how much of it is melting is so far unknown. So I've met with a scientist, but what I want to do next is meet with the people who live off the land. I want to see how the melting permafrost is affecting them. I'm hitting the road and heading far north to some of the most isolated communities in Russia. I'll be camping with reindeer herders along the way to my ultimate destination, Omyakon, the coldest town on Earth. Eliona! Oh. Eliona and our driver, Artum, will be making the journey with me. It's going to take four days of driving in treacherous conditions. First, we need to get across the Lena River, which for now is frozen solid. At least that's what I like to believe. Today is about an eight to 10 hour drive, getting from Yakutsk up to Kandiga, and that's where I'm gonna be spending the night. And back onto solid ground. We're now on the Koilima Highway, otherwise known as the Road of Bones. It looks like any other road, but very few roads have the history that this one does. It was built during the Stalinist era by the prisoners of the infamous Gulag labor camps. The skeletons of the forced laborers who died during its construction were just buried into the road itself. The road is notoriously treacherous. It was laid on permafrost, so it's twisted and uneven. 
In places, it's very narrow and covered in a layer of thick snow. A common practice during the coldest part of the year is to never travel alone. If you break down and you've got no help, bad things happen very quickly when it's minus 50. It doesn't take long before we spot trouble up ahead. This truck lost its load of pipes and went right off the road. I've heard so many stories about this road, how dangerous it is. Usually the weather conditions are bad. This road lives up to its name. An hour and a half later, there's another accident. So the emergency services guys are down there right now. Oh, wow. It's been just one obstacle after another all day long, and we still have a long way to go. We press on, but getting to Omicon is not going to be easy. After sneaking in a few hours of sleep in Kandiga, we're back on the road early the next day. So the plan today is to go a little further north up to one of the Gulag areas. Heaven forbid if you were a criminal or a political prisoner, this is where you would have been sent. Uh, it's quite a bit further north. It's going to take quite a few hours to get up there on a really bad road. And the camp is away from the roads. It's not going to be easy to find. There's a lot of barbed wire here. There's another building down there. The gulags were a vast system of prisons that spanned the entire Soviet Union. And between the 1930s and early 1950s, between 15 and 20 million people working hard labor, long hours, in all conditions, all seasons. Horrible. Work people to death. To honor the prisoners, locals have built a museum in their memory. Many were convicted of the most minor offenses, like Anna Aminalova. She survived, and her story can be told. But many did not make it out. These gates are not particularly high, not particularly strong, but then again, they didn't need to be in this terrain in Siberia. If you escape, you faced almost certain death in the wilderness. We're back on the road of Bones, and our plan is to reach the reindeer herders of Uchige first thing tomorrow. It's slow going, and we're down to one lane when we hit another roadblock. This is actually a pretty serious situation right now. We have several vehicles stuck on this road, and no one can move in either direction. Not good. Thankfully, it's not minus 50. Everyone pulls together. The road is cleared, and we can keep moving. We are free and clear for now. Fingers crossed. Time to switch up the mode of transportation. I'm joining the local reindeer herders for a journey into the wilderness. Their 1,400-year-old way of life is being threatened by the changing climate, and I want to understand more. Off to the next leg of my adventure. On a reindeer sled in Siberia. Woo! It's like dog sledding with less barking. Reindeer herders rely on the income from selling reindeer meat a staple in this part of the world. They're constantly moving and must trek every few weeks across this vast wilderness to find new pastures for their reindeer to graze. Whoa! Whoa! Ow. Oh. We just had some kind of harness failure. Ouch. After three hours of sledding, we've hit base camp. 
it's home for tonight. The temperature is minus 20, which is actually warm for this time of year, a trend the local herders have noticed. Every aspect of their life revolves around the weather, and they have to be able to work with it, work around it, and still be able to prosper and survive. But now, the warming climate and melting permafrost is slowly killing off the reindeer. Mikhail Pogodeyev has lived with the reindeer his entire life. He now advocates for their survival. When climate is changing and you see that there are, there are changes on the snow, snow conditions, the reindeer will starve if, if uh, the pastures will be packed with the ice. As warm spells increase, the snow melts, leaving a layer of water. But in a snap freeze, an ice crust forms that the reindeer can't penetrate to find food. 12,000 reindeer died of starvation last year. For the herders, climate change is very real. I'm camping out with the herders for the night. They're preparing a hearty meal, stew, hot tea, and vodka. A tradition they have here is to make a little sacrifice before every meal. Usually a bit of food or maybe a splash of vodka goes into the fire for good luck and health. It's time for bed. The sun is going down, and so are the temperatures. It's minus 40 degrees, and it's shaping up to be one of the coldest sleeps of my life. Tomorrow, the pole of cold is in our sights, and even this place isn't immune to climate change. The fire died about halfway through the night. Whew. Inside the tent, that's what happened to my water. It's kind of cold. It's time for me to leave the reindeer and carry on my journey north. We head out. We make sure to load up at the last gas station before Omyakon. After a day's driving, we make it to our final destination, the coldest town on Earth. It's a bumpy arrival. <laughs> I guess this is the kind of roads you get when you build your town on permafrost. The road just twists and buckles. In the 1920s and 30s, it was a seasonal stop for reindeer herders. Now, it's a permanent settlement of just 500 people. I finally made it to Oymyakon, the, the pole of cold. And on February 6, 1933, they recorded a temperature of minus 71.2 Celsius. Extremely cold, nowhere in the Northern Hemisphere has a temperature that low ever been recorded. It may be cold out, but our reception is warm. The locals are performing a traditional welcoming ceremony for us. So what is it about this place in particular that makes it so cold? The main reason is that Omicron sits in a valley. The cold air is trapped by these mountains, and it just sits there and pools. Beautiful blue sky, but bone-chillingly cold. But not as cold as expected. Today, it's minus 31. Aliona and I are at the local weather station, where we meet meteorologist Mika Bakarova. They've been recording temperatures for the last 50 years here and have observed some big changes. Local fishermen have noticed the shift as well. Arctic temperatures are expected to increase between one and a half to two and a half degrees by 2040 meaning the permafrost will continue to thaw at a dangerous rate. We're afraid that we're going to reach a tipping point where our carbon emissions cause the permafrost to melt, releasing methane gas, which causes the climate to warm, which causes the permafrost to melt even more. And you can see where this is headed. There's no doubt the temperature here is warming, but if global greenhouse emissions can be reduced, it may not be too late to halt this rise and keep the permafrost frozen. Thank you.